As the first speaker, let me introduce myself. My name is Kate Wrightsenstein and I'm president of the Modern Language Teachers Association. I also work as curriculum consultant for the Association of Independent Schools of WA. And prior to that, I worked as an Indonesian and English as a second language teacher, both home and abroad. And I will be talking about the cognitive benefits of language learning in the early years of life. So we are surrounded by language during every moment of our lives. We use it to communicate thoughts and feelings, to connect with others and identify with our culture and to understand the world around us. And for many people, this rich linguistic environment involves not just one language, but two or more. As a language, languages educator, I know that such an environment is good for the mind, for thinking, for memory, for the way that we form attitudes and beliefs, tackle problems and make decisions. In this discussion about the cognitive benefits, I will draw on my 20 years of experience of teaching to children from as young as five to late teenagers. I'm going to draw on two contexts that provide opportunities for, for learning and using two or more languages, namely bilingualism first and then second language learning. Along the way, I'm going to challenge some common myths and provide some advice on how to encourage your own or other children to navigate these rich linguistic environments. Let's start with bilingualism, which is defined as fluency in or the use of two or more languages. According to a recent report by the Commission for Children and Young People, more than 10% of children in Western Australia speak a language other than English at home. Let's see if that figure holds true for this crowd. Can we have a raise of hands if you speak a language other than English in your home? I think that beats the 10%. <laughs> Um, fantastic. So what do, what do such households look and sound like? This video I'm about to show you is of a family who live in Germany, but they're, in their household they speak Indonesian, French and English. The mother is Indonesian, the father is French, and the children have acquired English because that is what the parents use amongst each other. Only one child is of speaking age and they are discussing what to do about a pair of pants that have got a big hole in them. Apa yang rusak, Jo? Uh, uh, this one. That It, one. Kenapa? Oh, celananya bolong. Kok bisa bolong? Aku udah tahu kenapa bolong. Kenapa bolong? Kenapa okay. papa bolong? Fix it then. Tiens. Je pas? Je peux pas. Comment ça tu ne peux pas? Uh, there is no more there. Yeah, it's okay. If you want to put it on the floor, you put it on the floor. I play with it on the floor. You put it on the floor. No, it's not. It's not on the floor. Or let Louise repair it. Louise will finish the pants. Do you hold the pants? She will finish the pants. Now you put it on the floor. Can you put it on the floor with Louise, Jojo? Can you? C'est bien, Louis. C'est bien, hein? Voilà, maintenant tu as un petit frère. Louis? Oui. Maintenant? Maintenant, Louis est ton petit frère. Votre maman, il y a deux chalanas, non? C'est un scanner de Louis. Votre Louis? Il y a un peu de votre maman. C'est un anti. Voilà. Maybe just tomorrow. Oh, c'est un peu de votre maman. Maybe tomorrow. Ok. Voilà, Louis. Ah, 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 Louis, non. So as you can see, it doesn't matter what language is spoken or the fact that there's code switching going on. All members of that family have no problem making meaning, showing affection, uh, and problem solving about what to do with the pants. Today little brother will wear them, then maybe tomorrow mummy will be allowed to wear them, and then they might eventually throw them out. That's basically the content of that discussion. I want you to remember this family because I will refer to them shortly. Research into bilingualism has been extensive, with famous psychologist Vygotsky leading the way in the early years. According to Vygotsky, being able to express the same thought in different languages enables the child, and I quote, to see his language as one particular system among many, to view its phenomena under more general categories, and this leads to awareness of his linguistic operations. 
Subsequent research has come up with numerous positive findings such as these. Uh, the first point uses very fancy language, but basically it's saying that bilingual children read faster. <laughs> and, and I love a real comment. <laughs> and I love this um, quote by Ophelia Garcia. Bilingual children, such as the little boy that we saw in the video clip, would be part of a diverse range of networks. I found this clip on YouTube and did a little bit of investigating and found out that the family live in Germany. I'm guessing they probably live in an expatriate community and will probably attend a play group with other children from a wide variety of other nationalities. Every year, perhaps, they travel to visit the mother's family in Indonesia and the father's family and friends from France might visit on a regular basis. So this little boy is constantly engaging in a wide range of communication networks. Through these networks, his world is pretty big and the opportunities of what he could become are broad. As Wittgenstein, the great philosopher famously said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Certainly in the past there's been the belief that learning two languages confuses children and impairs their cognitive ability, or put another way, uh, speaking a language other than, official lang other than the official language of English could hurt a child's academic uh, success. That was certainly the case in my family. Research into bilingualism has identified that bilingual children may start speaking later than monolingual children or experience a silent period, but this delay is only temporary. My advice to anyone who speaks a language other than English in the home is keep doing it. If you're newly arrived, don't cease your language and switch to English. Um, for your children to develop the language, you need continued interaction on complex topics that go beyond household matters. If there's a community language school, get your children involved, involved to give them the greatest chance to fully develop their mother tongue. And I'm going to just go back to that last slide, sorry, because that last point is really important at this bit. Um, they need the chance to, to fully develop their mother tongue. And finally, build a positive attitude about language and its culture so that your child identifies positively with it throughout their life, proudly and with an open heart and a desire to share it with others. The other, rich, the other context for a rich linguistic environment is through learning a second or an additional language. <laughs> Typically for children, this is a subject taught at school, either by face-to-face tuition in the classroom or with, with a teacher or via distance education through technology. I'd like to share some things that happen in the minds of children when they learn a second language. Firstly, they develop an awareness of how language works, including their first language. As they learn a, a new systems of signs and symbols, they reflect on the systems they already know and ask the questions of this nature. It's a similar outcome for bilingual children previously discussed, but the difference is that an experienced language teacher will create a space for children to explore, reflect and talk about language. A skilled teacher won't brush over comments or questions like these. They would use them as an opportunity to develop, to develop overall literacy in the child. The second thing children gain is intercultural understanding. This is not just learning about another culture, but involves engaging with it, identifying what's different or similar to one's own culture, reflecting on why and the ability to act as a cultural, cultural mediator between two cultures. As our world becomes increasingly connected and our communities become increasingly diverse, having an intercultural capability is an essential 21st century skill. The last benefit of language learning that I want to share with you is really difficult to explain and show because it happens in the mind. Um, but it brings me great joy when I see it happening to the students that I teach. Here is probably the best image I can find of this process happening. You might recognise this person as our cameraman, Kenyon, <laughs> when he was a bit younger. This photo was taken on a study tour to Indonesia and we visited a wonderful school in a small village in East Java full of super friendly students and staff. Anyone who learns a, a, a language will understand this. What's happening here is really deep learning. 
an opportunity to test out all the knowledge previously taught. Keenan's concentrating very hard to comprehend what the other boys are saying while sim simultaneously trying to formulate a response. Two things will happen when he gives his response. Either they don't understand, so he gets that feedback, and it'll be quite apparent, so we'll have to try and try again. Or they will provide feedback that they understood, and, he'll, and in his head he'll go, yes! <laughs> and then continue to generate conversation. Keenan's probably coming across words he's never heard before, but he's making guesses about the possible meaning through context and other clues. And then, after hearing the word three times, he's certain he knows what it means, so he's constructing knowledge through, through this engagement. As you can see, he's in deep thought. I call this a state of brain gymnastics. He's experienced a string of aha moments, and he's probably thrilled by the fact that he's connecting with people. True? Yeah. <laughs> This is the buzz you get when you learn a second language and it's a joy to see, see children that you teach in this state. I will conclude by challenging this commonly held misconception that children are better at learning languages than adults. It's often accompanied by the excuse such as, I'm too old to learn a language. Um, the window of opportunity for kids is e to easily acquire a language in an organic way through immersion rather than learn in a systematic way, is known in linguistics as the critical period. And there is much debate about its duration. It's during this period that children are certainly most enthusiastic about language learning. However, older children and adults are able to draw on a wide, wider range of cognitive strategies and advanced literacy skills to help them with their language learning. What often holds older learners back are the effective fa factors, attitudes, feelings, perceptions, and the notion of how am I seen by others. Stephen Krashen's effective filter hypothesis explains how factors such as confidence, motivation, and anxiety have an impact on second language learning. Because language is so closely linked with identity, as children get older, they may become a bit reluctant to embrace the language and culture because they don't see it as part of who they are. Good teachers know how to mitigate this. Parents also have a role to play. So I'd like to close with some advice. If you have children who are learning a second language, be aware of the effect of factors and continue to encourage them with their learning. Why not start learning a language they are learning at school? Show them how adults can be learners and help them build their confidence by teaching, getting them to teach you a thing or two. If you are a teacher of languages, I also highly recommend taking up a new language now. Live in the shoes of your students to get to know what it feels like to be a learner again. It's, the, it's a great refresher course on cognition and probably the best PD you could ever do. So, thank you.